Welcome to the video help with physics problems for Physics 1A. This video will cover homework set 2, part 1, that's everything under the heading forces and particle dynamics. In 1121 this is questions 1 to 6 and a past exam question. In 1131 it's questions 1 to 8 and a past exam question. Please note that these are only sample solutions. There's many ways to do these problems. This is just one of them. Problem 1. In this problem, we've got a frictionless surface and two blocks. We've got one of mass 1 here, and we're told that mass 1 is 2.0 kilograms, and a block of mass 2, which has a mass of 1.0 kilograms. We have a force acting here which is 3.0 newtons. And in part A, we're asked to find the force of contact between the two blocks, which basically means how much force is this block with mass M1 pushing on the block with M2 with. Okay, so one way to do this is to work out the acceleration of the system. So F total is equal to M total, A total. The two blocks are accelerating at the same rate as they're touching each other. And so we've got 3 is equal to 2 plus 1 times A total, which tells us that A total is equal to 1. And so since the block M2 is accelerating at 1 meter per second and it's got 1 kilogram, we know that the force on block with mass 2, so let's call it F2 is equal to 1.0 times 1.0, and so the force is 1.0 newtons. Part B. Okay, in part B, it asks us to consider what happens if the force is applied in this direction instead. So now the force is equal to 3 newtons in this direction, and we've gotten rid of this one. Okay, so in that case, the acceleration of the system is going to be the same. We'll have this. But the force which M2 pushes on M1 will have the force on 1 is equal to the mass of 1, which is 2.0 times 1.0. So that's equal to 2.0 newtons. And so this is greater. It's not the same. This comes about because M1 has a higher mass than M2. So if we apply the force to M2, less of that force is used up, and so more is left to push M1. Problem 2. In this problem, we have a man standing in a lift. The man has a mass of 100 kilograms. The lift is on Earth, so he's going to be experiencing a downward force, mg. And as a reaction to that, if the lift wasn't moving, there'd be an equal and opposite reaction force going upwards with magnitude mg. Okay, part A says, um, what force does the floor of the lift exert on him if he's stationary? Well, if he's stationary, the floor of the lift is pushing up on him to cancel out this downwards mg force. So the force is equal to 100 times 9.8, which is equal to 980 newtons, and that's upwards. In part B, the lift is now moving up with a constant velocity. Well, when there's a constant velocity, the acceleration isn't changing, so there's no forces involved. So the force actually remains the same as it was initially. So force is equal to 980 newtons upwards. Part C. The lift is now accelerating upwards at 2 meters per second per second. So in this case, the floor is pushing on the feet of the man with this additional acceleration and hence force. So the force in this case is equal to the mg force, so the 9.8 
plus the MA force, which is this 2.0, times the M, which is 100. So that's 11.8 times 100, or 1,180 newtons upwards. Okay, part D is moving up but decelerating at 3 meters per second. So in this case, the acceleration is equal to minus 3.0 meters per second per second. So in this case, there's actually a force acting in the opposite direction, in the downwards direction. So the total force is equal to 9.8 minus 3 times 100, which is equal to 680 newtons. And that's still upwards, but it's less than it was before. With questions like this, it's useful to have a think about how you feel in the lift. As the lift decelerates, you, you feel lighter, you feel a bit as if your stomach's being left a bit behind. And that's because this force is less than, than G, which you're used to. Part E is moving downwards with an acceleration of 4 meters per second. So it's moving downwards with 4.0 meters per second per second. And so this is again a downwards, so not an upwards, a downwards acceleration. So it's 9.8 minus 4 times 100, which gives us 580 newtons upwards. Okay, because this is up, this is down, so overall it's still upwards, but it is less. And part F, it's moving down with a deceleration of 5 meters per second. Okay, so moving down but decelerating, so that's actually an upwards acceleration of 5.0 meters per second per second. So in this case, the force is equal to 9.8 plus 5 times 100. So that's 1,480 newtons upwards. So you feel a lot heavier when the lift is coming to a stop. Problem three. In this problem, we've got two bodies attached to each other, one of which is on an inclined plane. So the plane is at an angle of 30 degrees. We've got a body here with mass M1, which we're told is equal to 3.0 kilograms. We've got a pulley here, and we've got another mass hanging down here, mass M2, which is equal to 2.0 kilograms. They're attached by a string like this. And we're asked to find what's the acceleration of each body. Since the bodies are tied together, they're going to have the same acceleration. The best way to approach a question like this is to write down simultaneous equations for the total forces acting on the two bodies. The total forces acting according to Newton's second law is just going to be the acceleration of the body times the mass of the body. M2 is the easiest to deal with, so let's start with that. The total force acting on body M2 is M2A. Now let's assume that M2 is going to move upwards and M1 will move down the slope. If this assumption is wrong, we're just going to end up with a negative answer and we'll know that we made a mistake and we can switch it at the end. So if M2 is moving up, then the tension force pulling it upwards is bigger than the M2G force pulling it down. So we've got T minus M2G, these are acting in opposite directions and these are the only two forces acting on body M2. So this equation describes the total force acting on body M2. Let's do a similar thing for M1. So M1A, the total force acting on M1. Now in this case, we've got gravity acting on M1. Gravity is acting directly down like this, M1G. 
but we're only actually interested in the component of the gravity force which is acting parallel to the slope. So let's split the gravity force into a perpendicular and a parallel component. So this is 90 degrees. If this is 30, then this angle here is 60. So this is 60, and this angle down here is 30. So this side here is given by m1g sine 30, or in general, just sine theta. This side here is m2g cos theta. It's not important at the moment because we're told that this plane is frictionless. If the plane was not frictionless, we would have to consider it as friction is proportional to the reaction force, and hence we would need this. Okay, so we've got that one force acting on body M1 is the M1g sine theta down the slope, and then we've also got the tension force acting up the slope. Okay, so now we've written two simultaneous equations for body M1 and M2. Now we don't actually care about T at the moment, so let's call this equation 1 and this equation 2. We can add these equations together to cancel out T. So we've got the acceleration M2 plus M1 is equal to, these T's will cancel each other out, and we have M1g sine theta minus M2g. Okay, so let's substitute everything in. We've got A outside of 2.0 plus 3.0 is equal to 3.0 times 9.8 times sine 30 minus M2, which is 2.0 times 9.8. Okay, let's solve this on the calculator to find A. So we just work this out and divide by 5. Okay, when we do this, we end up with minus 0 0.98 meters per second per second. Now, we assumed that the acceleration would be this way, and we got a negative answer. So that tells us that the acceleration is actually 0 0.98 meters per second per second, with m1 moving up the slope. And... M2 moving downwards. So that's what happens if you make the wrong assumption. It's, it's not a big problem. Okay, part B, it asks us to find the tension in the cord. So what we can do is we can solve either this equation or this equation. We just need to be a bit aware that in these equations, we took the acceleration as in the wrong direction. So this is the acceleration that we need to use with these equations. So solving part 1, because that's the easiest equation to solve, we've got T is equal to M2A plus G. So that is equal to 2.0 times minus 0 0.98 plus 9.8. Solving that on the calculator, we end up with 17.64, which is 18 newtons. And that's this question. Problem 4. In this problem, we've got a plumb bob, which is a hanging mass hanging from the roof of a railway carriage. So let's draw the roof of the railway carriage. Here's the vertical to the roof, and the plumb bob hangs down, making some angle theta with the vertical. Now, the railway carriage is accelerating in this direction. Now, there's three forces acting on this plumb bob, so we need to draw them all. We've got the tension force acting upwards, we've got the mg force acting downwards, and we've got the ma force from the acceleration of the carriage acting across like this. Now what we need to do is draw these together in the vector diagram. But let's just have a think about it. Newton's second law tells us that the resultant force, F, is equal to MA. So the resultant force is MA. So the tension and MG have to add to give us MA. So let's draw a diagram showing that. Here's our tension force acting upwards. Here's our MG force acting downwards. And here's our resultant MA force. 
I've given it a double arrow to show that it's the resultant. Now from the symmetry, this T is this T, so these two are clearly parallel. Mg is acting vertically, so this angle here is theta. And now what the question in part A is asking us to do is to derive an expression for A in terms of theta. So we can just use simple trigonometry to do this. Tan theta is equal to opposite over adjacent, so that's MA over MG. Our M's cancel out, and that tells us that A is equal to G tan theta. And that is our solution to part A. Part B is relatively easy. It asks us when theta is 20 degrees, what is A? All we need to do is use a calculator and substitute in the numbers. G is equal to 9.8, so 9.8 times tan 20 gives us 3.6 meters per second per second. We weren't sure if 20 was to 1 or 2 significant figures. If we take it as 2 and we've given our answer to 2. You could put 4 meters per second per second, but let's leave it as 3.6. And then it asks us to find theta when A is 2 meters per second. So we have 2 should really be 2.0. So let's put 2.0 is 9.8 times tan theta. So we want to find inverse tan of 2 over 9.8. When you do that on your calculator, you end up with 12 degrees. Problem 5. In this problem, we have an aeroplane which is flying around a circular path at a slight angle. So this angle, theta, is equal to 40 degrees and our aeroplane is like this. We're told to assume that all the force that it needs comes from an aerodynamic lift force which is perpendicular to the wingspan of the aeroplane. So there's a 90 degrees angle there. Okay, we need to consider the forces acting on this plane. We've got the lift force, which is pulling it up. We've got the gravitational force, mg, acting down. And then our resultant force will be the centripetal force, which will be acting in this way. It's flying with a circle of radius r. So this is given by mv squared over r. Okay, now the... Resultant force is the mv squared on r, which tells us that the lift force and the mg force must add together to give, the, give this mv squared on r. So let's draw this all very clearly in a vector diagram. We've got the lift force going up like this. The angle that this makes with the horizontal is 50 degrees, because you, you can see this angle here will be... 40 degrees, our turn at angles on parallel lines, so this is 50 degrees. Mg going down like this, this is 40 degrees. And the centripetal force is towards the center of the circular path, so this is mv squared on r. This is the resultant force, these two add together to give this third force. Now we're asked to find this r. So what we can do is we can write tan theta is equal to, that's using this one which was our theta, mv squared on r over mg. Our m's will cancel out, giving us v squared over rg. Now we just need to substitute everything in. For our velocity, we told that our velocity is equal to 480 kilometers per hour, which is equal to 480 times 1,000 over 60 times 60 meters per second. Doing that on the calculator gives us 133.3 meters per second. Okay, so now all we need to do is substitute in here to find R. So R is equal to V squared over G tan theta equals 133.3 squared over 9.8 times tan 40. Doing that on the calculator gives us 2162 
which we want to write to two significant figures. So we can write this as 2.2 kilometres. We're now up to problem six. In this problem, we have a block which is being pushed against a wall. So here's our block. There's a force of 60 newtons acting on the block. The block has a mass of 3.0 kilograms. And we're told that there's friction between the wall and the block. And this is given for static friction, mu s is equal to 0.60. And the kinetic friction is equal to 0.40. OK, the question asks us, part A, will the block start to move? So the block will start to move if the forces acting on the block, up or down, can overcome the static friction force. So let's work out the maximum force of static friction which this block can have. So F friction max, and let's put an S for static, is equal to this is just mu s times the normal force, which is equal to 0 0.60 times 60. And when you do this on the calculator, you end up with 36 newtons. So the maximum friction force, friction will oppose the movement, so the mg force would be down, the friction force would be up. The maximum force is 36 newtons. OK, let's work out the force downwards, the weight force. So the weight force is equal to mg, which is equal to 3 times 9.8, which is equal to 29.4 newtons. So the weight force is in fact smaller than the maximum static friction force. So that tells us that the static friction force will overcome the weight force and the block will not start to move. So as F friction max static is greater than the mg, the block will not move. Okay, part B now asks us what is the force exerted on the block by the wall? Now the important point to note here is that we calculated the maximum static friction force. This is not necessarily the static friction force that is acting on the block in this case. This is the maximum possible case. Friction only acts to overcome an applied force. So in, in this case, the applied force downwards is mg 29.4. And so the static friction force acting upwards is just 29.4. Otherwise, if it was 36 upwards and 29.4 downwards, the block would be accelerating upwards. And we know that friction doesn't cause things to accelerate upwards like that. So the force due to friction is equal to 29.4, and that is upwards, it opposite direction to mg. And the other force we have acting from the wall to the block is the normal force which opposes this applied force so it's 60 newtons so um, and we've got n which is 60 newtons and that's in that direction and that's the normal force okay and so adding these two forces together we need to use Pythagoras's theorem because they're acting at right angles so we've got 29.4 newtons upwards and we've got 60 newtons across and so this is our resultant. Um, let's call this F total. So F total is equal to the square root of 60 squared plus 29.4 squared. Doing that on the calculator we end up with 66.8 but since everything here is to two significant figures we should write this as 67 newtons and we also need to work out this angle so the best way to do that is to use tan. Tan of theta is 60 over 29.4. Solving that on the calculator gives us that theta is equal to 64 degrees. So um, 67 newtons, 64 degrees um, below 
vertical. We'll answer it along with the diagram. Okay, problem seven for one one three one. This isn't a problem for one one two one. So in this case, we have a system with a pulley and a a two kilogram mass here. and a five kilogram mass. The five kilogram mass is initially 1.29 meters above this floor or this desk and we're asked to calculate the acceleration of each mass and the tension in the string. So the tension is acting upwards here and upwards here. The best way to approach this question is to write down an expression for each of the blocks. So let's call this block 1 and this block 2. All the forces acting on block 1 give us mass 1 times the acceleration, that's Newton's second law. And so we'll assume that because 5 kilograms is heavier than 2 kilograms, this 5 kilogram block will move downwards and the 2 kilograms will move upwards. So the biggest force acting on the 2 kilogram mass is T and it's acting upwards. And then we've got minus M1G acting downwards. For the other block, we've got the total force is M2A. And in this case, we've got M2G acting downwards, the largest force, minus the tension acting upwards. Now we've got two simultaneous equations here. Let's call this one 1 and this one 2. To solve it for A, we can add these two equations together. So when we add these together, we can take A out. We've got M1 plus M2. And when we add these together, the T's cancel out because this is T and this is minus T. And so we've got G as a common factor outside of M2 minus M1. And so solving for A, we've got G M2 minus M1 over M1 plus M2, just substituting in numbers 9.8 times 5 minus 2 over 5 plus 2. Doing that on the calculator, we end up with 4.2 meters per second per second. So block 1 here, the 2 kilogram block, will accelerate upwards. Block 2, the 5 kilogram block, will accelerate downwards. Now we've also been asked to calculate the tension, so let's substitute everything back into this formula 1. We've got tension is equal to M1 outside of A plus G, so this is 2 times 9.8 plus 4.2. Doing that on the calculator, we end up with 28 newtons. Part B. Calculate the position and the velocity of each mass at time 0.3 seconds. Okay, so both these blocks start from rest and have an acceleration of 4.2 meters per second acting on them. So to solve this, let's, let's start with considering block 1. Y1 is equal to V01T plus a half AYT squared. This is zero, it's got no initial velocity. So this is a half times 4.2 times 0 0.30 squared. Solving that on the calculator, we get 0 0.189 meters. So we should give it to two significant figures, so 0 0.19 meters. So block one ends up 1.9 meters above the bench and we need to calculate its velocity. So the velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus AT. And so this is the initial velocity zero. So this is 4.2 times 0 0.30. Doing this on the calculator gives us 1.3 meters per second. Again, and this will be upwards. This is above bench. Okay, now for the second block, they're tied together by a string, which is taunt. So if block 1 moves up 0.1 meters, 
0.19 meters, then block 2 moves down 0.19 meters. So the displacement for block 2 is equal to 1.29 minus the 0 0.19, which gives us 1.10 meters above bench. And it's also moving at the same velocity, but in the opposite direction. So V2 is equal to 1.3 meters per second downwards. Okay, part C, it says the string now breaks at t is equal to 0 0.30 seconds, string breaks. And we need to calculate the acceleration of each mass. Well, that's easy. Now that the string's broken, there's no tension acting on the strings. So the only force acting on the blocks is the mass force. And so the acceleration is equal to g, or 9.8 meters per second per second. Um, downwards for both of the masses. Okay, part D says the time taken for each mass to reach the floor after the string breaks. Okay, so let's look at mass 1, the 2 kilogram mass. It was 0 0.19 meters above the floor, so it has to fall 0 0.19 meters. It was its initial velocity at the 0.3 seconds was equal to 1.3 meters per second upwards and its acceleration is equal to minus 9.8 meters per second per second and so we can just substitute this in to the equation y naught is equal to sorry y is equal to y naught plus v naught t plus a half a t squared and we need to solve this to find t so the final displacement is zero when it's on the bench starts 0.19 meters above the bench starts 1.3 meters per second upwards and the acceleration is minus 9.8 downwards so let's make this a negative sign Okay, so now we've got a quadratic equation to solve. So the roots are given by minus b plus or minus the square root b squared minus 4ac over 2a. So that's minus 1.3 plus or minus the square root of 1.3 squared minus 4 times 4.9, but that's a negative, so we make this a positive times 0 0.19 over 2 times minus 4.9. Solving that on the calculator we get minus 1.3 plus or minus 2.3 over minus 9.8. Time can only be positive so we'll want minus 1.3 minus 2.3 over minus 9.8 which gives us 0 0.36 seconds. Okay, so that's for mass 1. For mass 2, we use this same equation, but we've got y naught is equal to 1.10 meters. We've got v naught is equal to minus 1.3 meters per second, and the acceleration is the same. Okay, so substituting in, we've got 0 is equal to 1.10 minus 1.3t minus 4.9t squared. Once again, we substitute into this formula to find the roots. When we do that, we end up with t is equal to minus 1.3 plus or minus 4.8 over 2 times minus 4.9, sorry, plus 1.3. And so to get a positive number, it's 1.3 minus 4.8 divided by 9.8, which gives us 0 0.36 seconds as well. So they actually hit the ground at the same time. 
Now here's a challenge for you. Have a think about whether this is a coincidence or whether this would happen whenever you cut the string. Okay, problem eight, which is a one, one, three, one problem. So in this case, we have a particle which is moving along the x-axis and at t equals zero, it's got a velocity equal to v naught and it's at x equals zero. So here it is going with velocity v naught. It's acted upon by a force which opposes the motion and has a magnitude proportional to the square of the instantaneous speed. So the force is proportional to v squared um, and we're told that the proportionality constant is beta so this is equal to beta v squared in opposite direction to v. Okay, now we're asked to find an expression for the speed of the particle. Okay, so Newton's second law tells us that the acceleration of the body times the mass is equal to the total force acting on it. The is going to be accelerating in the negative direction as this force opposes its motion. So this is going to be equal to minus beta v squared. This is the total force acting on the body. Okay, so we can write acceleration is equal to minus beta over m v squared. And now we're asked to find the speed. Acceleration is given by dv dt, and this is equal to minus beta over m v squared. And so we need to now integrate this to find out v. Beta and m are constants. So let's write this as dv over v squared is equal to minus beta over m dt. And we know initially it's got speed v naught and let's say it has speed v at time t. So this is dv over v squared is equal to minus beta over m. These are just constants so they can come out the front. v naught was at time zero, v was at time t, so this is dt. Okay, integrating 1 on v squared gives us minus 1 on v and we have to work that out at v and v naught is equal to minus beta over m t t and 0 so this is equal to minus 1 over v plus 1 over v naught is equal to beta over m t now we have to rearrange this because we're asked to find v which is in this term. So let's write 1 over v is equal to 1 over v naught plus beta t on m which is equal to over v naught m m plus v naught beta t and this we can rearrange to get v by itself gives us v is equal to v naught m over m plus v naught beta t. Okay, in part two, we're asked to find the position. And let's just recap. We've got v is equal to v naught m over m plus v naught beta t. And this is equal to dx dt as v is just the derivative of the position. v naught m and beta are all constants. t is obviously a function of t, so we need to rearrange this a bit. So let's write this as v naught m dt over m plus v naught beta t is equal to dx. And now we can integrate. We're told at time 0, it was at position 0. And we'll assume that at time t, is at position x. Okay, now when we integrate this function of t, with a t down the bottom here, we end up with a logarithmic function. So we've got this v naught m as a constant out the front. And then we've got 1 over beta v naught log m plus v naught beta t 
at 0 and t and this is equal to x from x to 0. Okay, so we've got v naught m is over beta v naught. Just moving this out the front. And this is log m plus v naught beta t minus log m is equal to x. So v naught m over beta v naught is equal to log m plus v naught beta t over m is equal to ah, times is equal to x. So let's just simplify this as much as possible and then we've got our expression for x. So x is equal to m over beta log. Now we've got, if we can divide both these terms by m, so this is just 1 plus v naught over m beta t. And that solved it for the position. Okay, next we're asked in part 3 to solve it for the acceleration. We define the acceleration in the beginning as minus beta v squared on m. We've got v here, so all we need to do is substitute in. This is equal to minus beta over m. v naught squared m squared over m plus v naught beta t squared. Let's cancel this m with this m. So we've got minus beta v naught squared m over m plus v naught beta t squared probably the neatest way to write this expression so we'll leave it like that. Okay now we want to do part b. We've got the expression v is equal to v naught m over m plus v naught beta t. We're asked here to determine the speed but in terms of x so rather than in terms of t we want it in terms of x. So what we need to do is replace this t here with a function of x. So we determined the position as a function of time. So we, for that we had x is equal to m over beta log 1 plus beta v naught t on m. So what we want to do is rearrange this, get t as a function and then we can replace the t in this expression with that. So we've got beta x on m is equal to log 1 plus beta v naught t on m. Okay, now raise each to the exponent. So we've got e b x on m is equal to 1 plus beta v naught t on m. So beta v naught t on m is equal to 1, sorry, e to the beta x on m minus 1 and so t is equal to m over beta v naught e to the beta x on m minus 1. Now all we need to do is substitute this back into this expression here. So when we do that we end up with v is equal to v naught m over m plus v naught beta m over beta v naught e to the beta x on m minus 1. Okay, these cancel. We've got an m here and an m here, which cancel. So we've got v naught over 1 plus e to the beta x on m minus 1. These cancel. And so we've got v naught e to the minus beta x on m. Okay, part two asks us for the acceleration of the particle as a function of the displacement. So we've got that the acceleration is equal to minus beta m v naught squared over m plus beta v naught t squared. So now we just need to substitute this into here. So we've got minus beta m v naught squared over m plus beta v naught, that square should be here, times m over beta v naught, these will cancel, e to the beta x on m minus 1, all squared. Okay, now we can't cancel out the m's at this stage, but we can expand this and we've got m 
minus m. So we actually end up with just the m e beta x on m or squared. So we can write this as minus beta m v naught squared over m squared e to the 2 beta x on m. Now we can cancel that one of these m's and we end up with minus beta v naught squared on m e to the minus 2 beta x on m. And that's the answer. Past exam question. Past exam question. In part A of this question, we've got a car travelling along a road with speed V. It applies its brakes and that causes a frictional force which opposes the direction of the velocity. And we're asked what's the braking distance and when we derive our expression for the braking distance we have to state whenever we use Newton's laws. Okay, let's have a look at all the forces acting on this car. We've also got its weight force acting downwards and to oppose that we've got the normal force acting upwards. We shall exactly cancel out this weight force as there's no acceleration in the vertical direction. Okay, so that is Newton's third law, we've got the reaction force opposing the action force here. Okay, now Newton's second law tells us that since this friction is the net force acting on the body, this is equal to ma. And we also know that this friction force is equal to the coefficient of friction times the normal force, which has magnitude mg. And in this case, we're using mu s as these wheels are rolling over the surface. So we've got a stationary surface between the wheel and the road. So if we used mu k, we'd actually end up with a larger braking distance, which is why we don't want cars to skid because the braking distance is then actually larger. So the frictional force is given by mu, k, mu s m g. Okay, so we've got a is equal to mu s g. Now we're asked to derive an expression for the braking distance. So to do that we can use v squared is equal to v naught squared plus 2 a s. So the final speed because it's braking is 0. The initial speed we're told is actually v and this acceleration is acting in the opposite direction to the velocity so this is minus 2 a well x because it's traveling in the x direction so this is really an x and so we have our braking distance x is equal to v squared over 2 a we're not given a in the question so we need to put a in terms of mu s and g just v squared over 2 mu s g and that's our expression for the braking distance now for part 2 all we need to do is substitute in some numbers. We'll be using mu s is equal to 0 0.85. And we're told, first of all, if v is equal to 50 kilometers per hour, what's the braking distance? So 50 kilometers per hour is 50 times 1,000 over 60 times 60, which gives us 13.8 meters per second. And so the braking distance is equal to 13.8 squared over 2 times 0 0.85 times 9.8. This gives us 11.6, which is 12 meters. In the second case, we're told V is equal to 80 kilometers per hour. We just do the same thing. We convert it into meters per second, 80 times 1,000 over 60 times 60, which gives us 22.2 meters per second and then substituting into the formula which we derived here it's equal to 22.2 squared over 2 times 0 0.85 times 9.8 which will give us 29.6 which is equal to 30 meters okay so that's the answer to part a
part B. In this part, we have a mass on an inclined plane. The mass is moving up the inclined plane with a constant speed v. Because v is constant, this tells us that the net force is equal to zero, as the mass is not accelerating. What we now need to do is consider all the forces acting on this mass. So we've got a force f, which is being applied to the mass. The mass has its weight force acting downwards. It's got a normal force acting perpendicular to the plane and it's also got a friction force which is going to oppose V and so act in this direction. Now the aim of the question is to work out what F is. You need to realise that as the net force is zero and it's not accelerating, these four forces will add together to give zero. OK, so let's start by working out what the frictional force is. The frictional force is going to be mu k, the coefficient of kinetic friction as the block is moving, times the normal force. OK, so what we need to do now is work out this normal force. The normal force will come about as the reaction force to two components, the reaction of F perpendicular to the plane and the reaction of Mg perpendicular to the plane. So let's split these forces into components parallel and perpendicular to the plane. Here's F. We can draw this is theta. So this is F cos theta. And here we have F sine theta. So this is the part pushing the block into the plane. So there will be a reaction force to that. Part of N will come about due to this. OK, now we need to do the same thing with the weight force. We need to break it into components parallel and perpendicular to the plane. So here's our weight force going downwards, mg. Now that's comprised of a component parallel to the plane and a component perpendicular to the plane. Let's have a quick look at the geometry. Here's 90, so this angle here is, sorry, this is theta, this is 90 minus theta. So this is the 90 minus theta, so we've got theta down here. So this one's mg cos theta, this one's mg sine theta. So pushing the block onto the plane, we've got the f sine theta and the mg cos theta, which tells us that the normal force will have magnitude mg cos theta plus F sine theta, and our frictional force will equal mu k mg cos theta plus F sine theta. Okay, so all our forces perpendicular to the plane are in equilibrium. The component of F and mg are balanced by the normal reaction force. So now what we need to do is consider all the forces parallel to the plane. We've got the frictional force that's acting down the plane. So there's also a component of the F force, this one acting up the plane. And then we've got this mg sine theta acting down the plane, the component of the mg force. So part of this force, part of this force, and part of this force. The normal reaction force is all perpendicular to the plane, so we ignore it when we're considering parallel components. So we know that zero is equal to, um, let's, let's put up the plane as positive, so M F cos theta minus the friction force, which is acting down the plane, And then the gravitational force is also acting down the plane. Okay, now the question has asked us to derive an expression for the magnitude of F. So let's move all the terms with an F over to one side and leave all the terms without an F on the other side. Okay, so we've got mu k sine theta with an F out the front minus cos theta is equal to minus mg sine theta minus mu k mg cos theta. Okay, let's, these negative signs, let's make them all positive and this one negative. 
And so we can write this as f is equal to, let's take mg out as a common factor, mg sine theta plus mu k cos theta over, we've got cos theta minus mu k sine theta. And that there is an expression for the magnitude of f. Now it's worth, because this is quite a complicated expression, just checking it for a simple case. Let's imagine that we made this plane horizontal. So now the plane's horizontal and that gives us theta is equal to zero. In this case, f would have no component perpendicular to the plane. And so n would be equal to mg. And we would expect the, the weight force and n perfectly balance each other. So we'd expect the friction force and f to perfectly balance each other. So let's just check that that happens. If we substitute in 0, f0, we've got mg, now sine of 0 is 0, plus mu k over cos theta, which is 1. So this is equal to mg mu k. And that is indeed the frictional force because we said the reaction force was n, which tells us that friction force is equal to mu k n, which is mu k mg. And so in this case, f at theta equals naught is equal to the friction force, which is what we expect. So that's good. Okay, part two. We're now asked to derive an expression for the work with done by f. So work is equal to f dot s, where these are in the same direction. So remember, it's moving up the slope with the constant velocity v, so ds will be up the slope, and f is in this direction. And we split that into a vertical and well, a parallel and a perpendicular part is theta, so this was f cos theta, this is f sine theta. Okay, so power is equal to dw dt, the f is constant, so this is f dot ds dt, ds dt is just v, and we've got the dot product of these two things, so we only consider the components acting parallel to each other, so this is f cos theta, so this is equal to f cos theta, and this is v, so this is f v cos theta, is the power expended by this force f. Okay, now in part 3, we've got a car on a banked roadway, it's going around a radius, R and we're asked to derive an angle theta um, for which the car goes around the bend at uniform speed v and that there's no frictional forces either up or down the plane. Okay, so let's consider all the forces acting on our car in this case. We've got the weight force mg going downwards. We'll have the centripetal acceleration here mv squared on R. And then we've also got our normal force going up like this. Now the mv squared on R is the net force, the acceleration force, ma. So n plus w should equal our centripetal force. So let's draw a diagram showing this. We've got mg going down. We've got the normal force going at an angle and then these added together give us the FC and these are perpendicular to each other. Now just looking at the geometry, okay so this is theta so this angle in here would be theta and this angle would be 90 minus theta so this is 90 minus theta and this is theta. Okay now the centripetal force is given by mv squared over r and so we can use this to derive an expression for theta. Tan theta is equal to opposite over adjacent so that's mv squared on rmg 
And so we've got theta is equal to the inverse tan of V squared over Rg. And that's the answer to that part. Now, part four asks us to state the direction of the force that the car exerts on the driver in case three. Explain your answer in one or two clear sentences. Well, the force which the track exerts on the car is the same as it exerts on the driver. The driver is attached to the car, it's in the car, and so the direction is just going to be in the normal direction. So in the direction of N as has same direction as track on car.